All right, so the word believe, let's just do a kind of delve into this one word. And uh, um, so the reason I was going to go into this is it's, in, it's probably the, the one word in the Bible that has got the greatest theological significance to it. And so if we get the word believe wrong, what we think it means, um, it's soteriologic. It's a salvation issue. And so I thought, well, um, l l let's, let's look at it and then let's expound on it a little bit. But to me, it's, it's important um, to understand the word. So no other word has as much theology attached to it as the word believe. Um, Pistis, yeah, all the English derivations of it. Believe, faith, have faith, be faithful, um, persuaded, convinced. Convinced, all of those words are all pistis. They're all the same Greek word. Because what we need to be aware of then is that that one Greek word can have five or six different nuances, right? But if we disassociate belief from persuaded. If we disassociate those two, we might not realize that belief, um, the nuance of belief is persuasion, is conviction, so on and so forth. Just, I believe there's a word over there. Like this guy, you're realizing, ooh, you're um, interpreting belief much looser than, than I think the scripture allows you to. A couple examples, guys. Uh, Joel Olstein, I forgot somebody was trying to put him on the spot. And they asked about another guy that was of a particular religion. And as soon as they mentioned the religion, you are immediately going, oh, yeah, those guys have a lot of false doctrine, a lot of heresy. So they put Joel Olstein on the spot, and he says, well, he believes in Jesus, so I think he's fine. And it was one of those things where you go, man, so this word belief, it's important that we... Um, Robert Schuller, you guys know who that is? The old, old, I think he's passed away now. Old, old guy, that, that the Crystal Cathedral. Yeah. And he had Billy Graham up on a big screen. And he asked Billy Graham about who was saved. And he says, well, I think there are, get this definition, there are a lot of people that believe in Jesus even though they've never heard of him. What? Okay. That's because it says something, hello, hello, feel free. Feel, oh yeah, feel free, no worries. Yeah, so Billy Graham said that. There's a lot of people that believe in Jesus even though they might not know, uh, they might not have ever heard of Jesus. So and so... You know there's a creator because you have no excuse. That one, remember, the Bible says. Right. You know, cause you have no excuse because you've seen what I've done. So for that reason, uh, I thought that this would be worthwhile. Um, so it's just one word the word believe, but um, let's, let's look at a couple instances of it in Scripture real quick, guys. And I'm thinking, let me think, just to make sure we get through this, guys, because my number count says this should take us about four and a half hours. <laughs> so just to make sure we get through this, the first questions you have there beginning, put a square around each of these words. I was going to have you turn to each of those texts, but let me just give you the Scripture, okay? I mean, let me just tell you what it was. The first one, Romans 4. What does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. I gave you the blank, but I also gave you the believed already. Uh, that was a mistake. But put a square around. <laughs> believed was supposed to go in the blank. John 3, 16. God so loved the world that he gave his only son for whoever believes, believes in him should not perish. That's your blank. Romans 5, 1. Therefore, since we've been justified through faith. faith, we have peace with God. Uh, Hebrews eleven sixteen. Therefore, without faith. faith, it's impossible to please God. Now, if it's impossible, then, then it's important that we have the right <laughs> idea of what it is, right? It's good you've heard about it, right? <laughs> 
And then uh, I think the last one, Hebrews uh, 11, 6, I already gave that. And then uh, another one, 2 Timothy there in your list, 2 Timothy 3, 14. You, however, continue in the things that you have learned and have become convinced of. Now, those are, we can um, understand, important theological texts. Every one of those verses uses the word pistis. So every one of, those, one of those words is the same word in the Greek. <clears throat> so it shows us that there are different words used, and we would want to be able to know that they're all the same. One word in the Greek. Um, so let's go from this. Obviously, we've just seen the, the word translated as believe. We've seen it translated as faith, persuasion, convinced. And what I want to make sure that we can walk away with, guys, is that we're familiar with all of these nuances so that we can understand the term. To, and then for us to have, because there's so many different nuances, maybe we can come up with our own word that would, when we see these other words, faith, belief, conviction, convinced, that we can maybe have our own word that helps kind of tie it all together for us. And we'll work our... Let's just do it like this. Let's just get started and then we'll see. So the actual words that we're talking about today comes from this word, which we would write like this. But this word comes from <clears throat> this word, which you guys are already going to be more familiar with. So I want us to skip this first word and deal with this one. How many of you have seen this word? Pathos. That's the root. Patho, pathos. Literally, you're going to see this word pistis, but it comes from this word pathos. So let's understand what does pathos mean. In English, pathos is an argument that stirs someone's emotions to convince them of what you want to convince them of. So it's the art of persuasion. Did I give you guys? Yes, turn it okay, so let's start with pathos. Uh, it means the ability to be able to persuade. So that's our word, persuade. That's the root and that's where the other word comes from. Uh, so pathos is to persuade. Pistis means to be persuaded. That's going to be your layman's terms. Um, oh, I gave you a little side note. You guys will recognize what happens when you put... So this means to persuade. Okay. What happens when we put an A in front of any word? Changes it to the apathetic. It's the opposite. So when we put an A in front of the word... It becomes this. So the opposite of pathos is apathy. And the word is persuaded. And I think I gave you guys. It might be more like conviction versus apathy. Yes. Uh, um, let, let me uh, in, look at the word for apathy there. Don't, it means don't care, not convinced. Like listening to a song, I'll bring that one up in a minute. Apathy is a sense of an indolence of mind, an indifference to what should excite you. Excite means compel you to do something. So apathy, indifference. Indifference to be unmoved. And that word in Scripture is called disobedient. Whenever we see apetheo in Scripture, it says, and they did not obey, they were disobedient. That's always the word apathy is translated in Scripture. But I like knowing that it's apathy because what it means is, I hear what you're saying, but I don't care. I don't care. So this word, believe, right, I don't care. Uh, does that... For, does that do anything? Now, when we look at it from that sense, when we realize that that word gets translated as believe, 
Believe is this idea. I'm persuaded. I'm, ex I'm, I'm excited, not excited literally, but by what you said. I'm motivated. I'm engaged. I'm there with you. And uh, that's one of the nuances that I wanted to convey. And then the opposite of this, apathetic, means shrugging my shoulders. Doesn't, doesn't, affect, doesn't change me at all. Doesn't affect me at all. I, I feel like that's a powerful insight. So for our definitions on your page two, guys, I think when you see the idea of belief or faith or conviction, one of those, I think what I would want to be imagining in my mind is um, to be completely persuaded and then to know that the opposite of that, I think they're making coffee for their... To be completely persuaded and engaged and then the opposite of it is for somebody to have the same information but they shrug it off, um, not important. So let's look at a couple examples of how Scripture uses the word. The first example, let's go to Numbers 14. While you guys are turning to Numbers 14, a couple of the examples I had about being uh, unconvicted, being unconvinced, shrugging your shoulders, apathy. Uh, I've used the example when, uh, I think it's Merle, Merle, Merle Haggard wrote the song, Mamas Don't Let Your Babies Grow Up to Be Cowboys. Merle Haggard gives the average mother all kinds of advice about who to let your daughter date and who to not let your daughter date. Raise them to be doctors and, wait, mamas don't let your babies. Oh, mamas don't let your babies grow up to be cowboys, not date cowboys. So mamas are told what to not let their sons do. Raise them to be doctors and lawyers, but not cowboys. So how many of you put that to practice? Took it seriously? <laughs> so there, right there is the nature. You heard the song. Merle Haggard was giving you advice. You might have even sang along several times. So were you um, persuaded? Or, there you go, were you persuaded? I, I don't even know which words. You were entertained. That, you guys, is the, is, if, if that's all you take home, that's what I'm feeling I wanted to convey in the class. You can hear something. You're either going to be pathos, which means persuaded, which is the word believe, and you're going to do what it says. Or you're just going to listen to it and be entertained and like the song, but you're going to be apathetic. You're going to be uh, indifferent, unmoved. So let's look at a couple examples um, in the Old Testament. Numbers 14, let me give you the background. Uh, this is uh, Moses is working with the Israelites. They are all out in the wilderness. Everybody's getting grumpy. Everybody's getting grumpy around chapter 10. Um, God instructs, God is getting the logistics of walking a million people through the wilderness, through the desert. While he's establishing these logistics, people are getting grumpy and cranky and wanting to go back to Egypt, as a matter of fact. So he says in around chapter 10, he says, first thing I want you to do is make some trumpets and I want you to blow the trumpets. And whenever you blow the trumpets, that means everybody needs to gather around, come listen to the words of God. He offered them protection every time they were to go into the wilderness. What was supposed to go in front of everybody? Do you guys remember? The Ark, the Ark of the Covenant was supposed to go in front, and that would be like God going and defeating all the enemies in front of the Israelites. So God was providing organization, structure, logistics, and protection. He had already, let's remember, he'd already brought them out of Egypt. He'd already saved them from Egypt. But in chapter 11, um, you guys might kind of want to brush through these. I don't know if you'll be able to get anything out of it. But chapter 11, they all complain. At least in Egypt, we had fish. We had cucumbers. We had leeks. We had onions. And we had garlic. So they began demanding meat from God. So we want to get a feel for what's happening to these people because we're going to find out that it makes God pretty angry. So that's what's happening. He gets so upset, he goes, okay, 
I'm going to send you some quail and I'm going to send it till what? Till it comes out your nose. So for 30 days, they had so much quail that they were sick of it and it was coming out their nose. The people became so unruly that Moses complained to God, I can't do this by myself. God has to tell him to ordain what? Seventy more elders. So he's not the only guy exhorting the crowd. Now his own brother and sister is mad at him. Things were falling apart logistically. And um, they get to the edge of Canaan and God says, okay, here we're at Canaan. I want you to go in and take it. And let's pick up reading there. Numbers 14, 1 through 3. Everybody's pretty stressed out. Verse 1, all the congregation raised a loud cry and the people wept that night. And all the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The whole congregation said, would that we have died in the land of Egypt. So start thinking of the different adjectives that you would ascribe to this whole picture that I've described coming from numbers, the whole picture. I wish we would have stayed in Egypt. What, what, what is that an example of? <laughs> Ungrateful. Yeah. Ungrateful. So those are the types of things. This is what's happening to the people. Do they believe that God is God? I think so. They were scared to go up on the mountain. They've heard him. They've, they were rescued by him. They were brought out of Egypt by him. They were given food by him. They were given food by him. That, those are the things that... Their shoes didn't wear out. Shoes didn't wear out. Good. So this is what I want you to get the feel for, guys. Here, here's, and this is what God is dealing with in these people. So wish we would have died in Egypt. Or would that we have died in the, or would that we have died in the wilderness? Why is the Lord bringing us into this land to make us fall by the sword? What was their protection? The Lord. The, Lord. the Ark of the Covenant always went in front. God always went in front and had always, and had all, yeah, like a, like a hornet that drives out an enemy before you. So they're afraid of dying by the sword. There's no faith. Our wives and our little ones will become prey. Wouldn't it just be better for us to go back to Egypt? So what if you're taking your kids on the way to Disneyland and two days into the trip, they just go, oh, I would just rather go home. I don't want to be here. They've ultimately had enough inconvenience and they no longer wanted God's leadership. So verse 10, verse 10, So all the congregation said to stone them with stones, but the glory of the Lord appeared to the tent of meeting to all the people of Israel. And uh, so there was all this rebellion. So if you were to imagine yourself in the same scenario, what would you feel about the people that are complaining? What words would you use? Oh, it is a mutiny. Wow. Wow. So these are the nuances of what's happening in the story. And let's see what God says next about them. Numbers 14 and verse 22. Verse 22 so then, none of the people who have seen my glory and my signs, all the things I did in Egypt and in the wilderness, yet they have put me to this test these ten times. They have not obeyed my voice. Yeah, that's what I skipped. Verse 11. And the Lord said to Moses, how long will these people despise me? How long will they not believe in me, in spite of all the things I've done. That's our word pistis. But is that the word that you would have put there? How long will they not believe? In, I, in our language, I would say, I would have said follow or, yeah, how come they're not following me? How come they won't obey. obey me? That's the word I think we would have put there. So those are the nuances that belong. That's what's missing off your list. Ah, yeah. 
So I don't feel like in our vernacular we would have chose, they don't believe in me. I think we would have chose, um, how come they won't obey me? What was the other ones you guys said? Well, maybe you can use one of these other words, convinced. Why aren't they convinced that I am the Lord? Yeah, especially when he says, despite all the signs. All the signs. Why aren't they? Yeah, you guys got the picture. Put unconvinced. Put unconvinced? Oh. Shouldn't it be, why aren't they convinced? Well, and, and on that side oh, <laughs> I see what you're saying. Yeah, unconvinced. Con unconvinced. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever it takes to make it spell correctly. Yeah, see guys, those are the nuances. That the, all of those ideas are the are the idea that's conveyed by the word uh, pistis, which it complicates it, guys. But it's it's even better if we go to the word that pistis is based on, which was pathos, apathy, and pathos. That's that's really the root we want to get to. But those are the nuances. Why aren't they obeying? Why aren't they convinced? Why aren't they persuaded? So this is what we want. I like I said, guys. I get confused which one to give you, but patho is really the root. Pistis is the, the the part of that. But what I'm trying to say is, uh, this is this this is the 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 domain, the the realm of nuances that that word holds. I think it's much more powerful than. Uh, when I heard, uh, you know, uh, Billy Graham say, well, they might be believers, even though they've never ever heard the gospel or never even heard Jesus' name. They might be, but really, can they be all of these things if they've never ever any of these things? And that's, that's why the word's important to me. All right. So that, that was one example of, uh, we, we looked at that whole um, idea to, to look at one phrase. Let me just give you one more tonight, guys, and we'll turn to Numbers chapter 20, and we'll see the word pistis used again in Numbers chapter 20. We'll walk through that example. Uh, Numbers chapter 20, and let's walk through this one. Um, Moses now. You guys are going to want to watch Moses because this word is going to relate to him. Numbers chapter 20. We've proceeded. We've seen how everybody's frustrated, what's going on. And the leader, the God's uh, authority, he's going to lose his temper. And God is going to use this idea of pistis to remark about what Moses has done. So let's look at it. We'll start in verse 3 through 5. The people start to quarrel with Moses in verse 3. And the people quarreled with Moses and said, Would that we had perished when our brothers perished before the Lord. Why have you brought the assembly of the Lord into this wilderness so that we should die here, both we and our cattle? Why have you made us come out of Egypt to bring us to this evil place? Is it no place for grain or figs or vines or pomegranate? And there's no water for us to drink What's the word, what's the adjectives that we use in that sentence? Negative, quarrel. Okay. Ooh, there you go, grumbling. That's what we wanted. Okay, so we've got grumbling, <laughs> ungrateful, quarrelsome, she said. Ooh, good one, quarrelsome. Um, there's a scripture in the Bible, this word here, guys, 
is a very important word because there was a scripture, we, we could do a word study on it, and it says uh, fac factious men, men that are factious, men that quarrel and grumble about things. And I forgot what it says to do about them, but it's a terrible sin to, to cast them out of your midst. So God hates this. S-O-M-E. S-O? M-E. Oh, coral son. That's right. Because the daughters could be that way too. So let's put them both in. <laughs> let's be all inclusive here. Okay. Um, love that. Guys, this is way better than what I had planned, but this is taking sh good shape. So, okay, so let's keep on reading down. We don't want to be here. There's no water for us. That's the new complaint. Numbers 20, let's look at verse 7, and we'll keep, keep reading the story. So the Lord spoke to Moses and said, Take the staff the, uh, and assemble the congregation, you and Aaron and your brother, and put a square here, tell the rock. To tell the rock. What do you guys just have? Speak. Speak to the rock. Okay. <laughs> tell the rock before their eyes in front of everybody to yield water. So you shall bring water out of the rock for them and give drink to the congregation and their cattle. So Moses here got the instructions from God. And uh, God could have taken a number of... God could have taken a number of routes um, towards these people. He's already been upset at them. He's been angry at them. He's had fire come down in the past. He's tired of their grumbling. But in this particular case, it looks like God is, wants to just meet, appease them, meet their need. Unfortunately, Moses resorts to hellfire and brimstone. So Moses resorts to volume and might. And let's see how God appreciates Moses improvising. Numbers chapter 20 and verse 9. Moses took the staff from before the Lord as he had commanded him. Then Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rocks and said to them, Hear now, you rebels, shall we bring water from you out of this rock? So Moses lifted up his hand. He struck the rock with the staff twice, and water came out abundantly. Congregation drank in their livestock. Uh, let's just put a, a pause in this for just a minute, guys. I reflect on that. I've, I already knew this story. But I reflected, and I thought, mm -hmm. how many times, even though people are rebellious, has God wanted his ministers to minister, to pastor, to uh, speak kindly and to try to appease, whatever the word might be. And yet people have resorted to hellfire and anger and fist pounding. And I, I feel that's my lesson from this. God sometimes likes us to convey an idea in a soft, gentle tone. That's what he wanted here. And Moses thought it would be better if he pounded his fist and made a big hubbub about it. Uh, that's a little side takeaway, I think. But uh, hellfire and brimstone, I thought that was volume. I think I heard one time that some preachers think volume makes right or volume equals authority. I don't remember, but you don't always have to be loud. That was the message for me. Okay, so let's keep reading. Verse 12, uh, here's the problem with what Moses did. And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, because you did not obey me, Follow my directions. Trust, Trust me. Believe. He uses pistis. Yeah. Because you didn't believe me. Uphold me as holy in the eyes of the people. Therefore, you shall not bring this people into the land that I get. Therefore, Moses, you're going to die looking at the promised land, but I'm not going to let you walk into the promised land. There, ooh, there's a testimony there. I told you to speak softly, and you chose hellfire and brimstone, so you don't get in. There's a lot of nuances to all that. Stole his thunder. S stole his thunder. Yeah. M yeah. Um, just like uh, Saul, Moses thought, that's, that's not bad, God, but I got a better idea. Watch this. Let me try it my way. Speaking softly might not be the way to deal with an unruly crowd, but God said it was. 
And when God says you didn't uphold me as holy, do we know holy? The word hagias is holy and all it simply means is other. I am other. And what that means is I'm not like you. You should have shown the people that I'm not like you. In a time when people may expect me to bang my fist and rain down thunder, I'm not like you. I'm going to let this one go and be nice and be gracious. And you did not represent me well in front of this mob. Boy, that's a powerful testimony for me. So there it is again, peace, peace. Um, you did what seemed right to you. That's it. I, I had the two examples. Um, that uh, this, this idea of believe, faith, faithful, it's so much broader and I think really more important that we wrap our mind around what it is. Because I get concerned every time I hear someone suggest, well, they believe in Jesus, so that's, that's good enough. They're, they're probably okay. And I get concerned at that because our list would suggests that there's a lot more to it.